We face a common problem but have a patchwork of solutions, some living under effective lockdown while others can still socialise, study and travel. Tonight, what are we doing right and wrong and is there a strategy that can solve this all? Welcome to Postcode Lockdown, A Divided Nation. Well, good evening. If you're watching tonight in Wales, a full firebreak lockdown is coming your way later this week. In Northern Ireland, you have it already and aren't allowed to socialise, go to the pub or even to school. But across much of England, millions are still free to do all those things. The pandemic response across the UK is a patchwork depending on your postcode and still cases continue to rise. Tonight, we will ask what impact those measures are having and what we should do next. Are we again late in taking tougher action or do we need a radically different approach? Well, with me tonight, virtually, I have three experts to help explore those next steps. Anders Tegnell is Sweden's state epidemiologist. He has become famous as the face of its unique approach to the pandemic, which avoided strict population-wide lockdowns. Professor Sir Mark Walpott was the UK's chief scientific advisor from 2013 to 2017 and is currently a member of the government's SAGE advisory group. And Calypso Chalkadu is Professor of Public Health at Imperial College London. Thank you all so much for joining us. Well, from across the United Kingdom and beyond, we have a virtual audience who will share their ideas on what we could do next and tell us what they make of the proposals they're hearing. Hello, audience. Plenty more from them later. But first, what about the politicians and those advising them? As we know too well, they don't speak with one voice. These figures are flashing at us like dashboard warnings in a passenger jet, and we must act now. It's not possible to be absolutely certain where somebody actually picked up the virus. We wear masks in college, yeah. we do a lot of social distancing, but it's really um, frustrating to know, not knowing yeah. if I'm safe. Greater Manchester, the Liverpool city region, and Lancashire are being set up as the canaries in the coal mine. I'm in two minds on whether to keep the doors open or close them. This couldn't have come at a worse time. The economy's not going to grow. I have genuinely concluded that a circuit break is in the national interest. It just means that there were like large crowds at 10 o'clock outside the pubs instead of it being like at 12 o'clock. They told us close immediately or take a thousand pound fine. And obviously we still have quite a lot of members training. I said to the officers, listen, I'm not asking anybody to leave. So first night then, let's remind ourselves where we are. In England, a tier system divides the country into tier one, two and three. In tier one, there is a 10 p.m. curfew for bars, pubs and restaurants and gatherings of up to six are allowed indoors and outside under the rule of six. In tier two areas then, like London, households are banned from mixing indoors, but the rule of six still applies to outdoor spaces. In tier three, which includes the Liverpool city region, more restrictions are in place, including the closure of pubs and bars, and residents are advised against traveling in and out of their area. In Scotland, restaurants, bars and pubs are closed across the central belt, although Nicola Sturgeon has been criticized for not going further. In Northern Ireland, the so-called circuit breaker does go further with schools closing too, but places of worship and gyms are allowed to stay open. And in Wales then, today's big news, the government there has announced a firebreak lockdown, as well as banning people from crossing the border into Wales from parts of England with high case numbers. So, first time we go to the audience, I want to check with you first of all, who here knows the measures you are? Are you confident about what the advice is where you live? A show of hands, if you will, for that. Okay, most of you, some of you not 100% sure. Who thinks that those measures are right 
for where you are? Does it feel appropriate where you live? You're starting to think about it. OK, maybe about half of you think it's appropriate. And perhaps the key question, do you think the UK government is making the right or the wrong decisions in trying to tackle the pandemic? Hands up if you think they are making the right decisions. Two or three of you. OK, that is not resounding at the moment. That was our audience's view then, but we've also been asking the public, with the cooperation of YouGov, what they make of the current situation. This is what they had to say. Two-thirds of people then told us they were scared of the impact of coronavirus this winter. 29% said that they weren't. A majority, 52%, said the UK government is generally making the wrong decisions on how to handle the coronavirus. 26% said their decisions are generally right. And nearly two-thirds, 61% of people, told us they don't trust Boris Johnson to make the right decisions over the virus, while 31% said they did trust him. And of all the leaders or levels of government that we tested, only Nicola Sturgeon isn't more mistrusted than trusted to make the right decisions. 43% trust her, and as you can see, 43% do not. So the public, our poll suggests, is clearly worried about the pandemic, questions the Westminster government's approach to it, but what about our panel then? And as Tegnell, Sir Mark Walport, and uh, Professor Calypso Chalka do, welcome properly to you. And as Tegnell, um, first of all, no paths come without pain. Every decision right now has consequences. That is where we are with this pandemic. But overall, do you think the UK government's approach right now is the right one? It's very difficult for me to um, have any kind of review of the UK government's decisions. I think what we learned from this that is that we have a very difficult disease to work with. And you need to work very much with your, with your local, uh, how it works locally for you. How, the, how is the context where you are? What are the things you can do? And especially what are the things you're seeing? How do you adapt your response to uh, the actual situation? And, and how do you do that in a reasonably quick manner without changing your route too often? So Mark, let's go to you. The tier system was to, supposed to simplify everything. You might say it has led in some levels to division and acrimony. Uh, was this inevitable, do you think, if testing shows where the virus is, that we would see a patchwork of responses? Well, it's inevitable that in different parts of the country, there are going to be different levels. And if you look at the Orkneys and Shetlands, for example, there are very, very few cases indeed, because people are naturally more socially distanced. And on this issue of leadership, it is frankly much easier to be an advisor than it is to actually be the leader making the decisions. Um, they're balancing lives and livelihoods. And it's not surprising that people are upset about what's going on. And I think if you look across Europe, where cases are rising in almost every country, uh, even in Germany, where there are more than 5,000 cases a day at the moment, uh, there are leaders are you know, perceived very similarly. And uh, the job of the scientist on stage is to advise the government on uh, how to best control the pandemic. Uh, but they also, the government is obviously also thinking about the economy. And obviously the danger is that uh, the compromise, which is trying to be reached between the two, doesn't adequately control either. That is the big rub, isn't it? We'll come on to more about that in just a moment. But in terms of the concern of people, Professor Cholkadu, two thirds, as we saw there, are concerned about this. Are they, in your view, right to be concerned? And do you think the government has got the balance just about right? Well, I think it's a tough call, as we've just heard. But I think people are very much right to be confused. I think so far, the uh, government response itself has been rather confused, inconsistent, despite the best of intentions and knowing this is a tough uh, virus to deal with. But from a, an operational standpoint, frankly, I think the UK's uh, response has also been uh, rather poor. Take test and trace, for example. I think it's really not acceptable that it's not operating at the levels that we would like it to be operating at in order to be able to uh, consider options other than uh, national shutdowns, national lockdowns as a solution to managing the virus in the short term. So uh, there's a cacophony of uh, expert opinion, expert view 
uh, and even though that's not perhaps the uh, the fault of the government directly, I think it is problematic, and I think people, all of us, are rightly confused. Uh, well, let's uh, get the view then of our audience now, some of their experiences of this pandemic. Let's go first to the city region at the centre of that row, that public row between central and local government, Greater Manchester, and Karen Hill is there. Uh, hello, Karen. How are you feeling about life there right now? Um, it's a very difficult at the moment because we've just been told today that all our hospitals are at full capacity and Andy Burnham is refusing to actually lock down uh, the Manchester area. And I think if Liverpool can do it and Lancashire can do it, I think we should be doing it. And it's not about political agenda, it's about saving lives. Well, Karen, you're still in tier two, of course, for Greater Manchester after those talks today. Government says it is still considering next steps. Worth remembering that people in the Manchester area have been living under some form of stricter COVID restrictions for more than two months. Cases in most of the areas, though, are still going up. Manchester city centre itself, they had an influx of 70,000 students into the city. Figures there have fallen. But in the nine other boroughs that make up Greater Manchester, they are still going up. The figures are, for example, Wigan, 28% week on week, uh, the week ending the 12th of October. Bolton, too, 28%. Bury, 25% week on week. And Bolton, one of those areas that saw its first case of 1,000 cases uh, for the week as well. So one of those areas that has certainly been in lockdown for a long time. Uh, in Derby, though, 50 miles away, people are still under the lowest tier of measures and free to socialise within the rule of six. Nadia Sella lives in Derby. Hello to you, Nadia. What's your experience then? Oh, hi, Anna. Uh, I'm Nadia Sally, and I'm a mum of two from Derby. Uh, I started out working from home during the lockdown and homeschooling my eight-year-old with a three-year-old who wants to join in all the time. Um, our favourite school activity was a homemade sports day in our garden. I think, thankfully, um, no one in our household caught the virus, but we did miss having family over to celebrate Eid with us. Um, we're still really cautious about the virus and I think we try our best to limit any time our children spend in any shops or anything that isn't necessary. Um, and personally, I've been inspired to spend more time outdoors and to sort of vlog as well. Um, the one thing that my children have enjoyed recently is the return of swimming lessons and after school hobbies. And I think as much as our tier classification of lockdown allows, we'd keep, we, I think we'd keep doing this. Well, Nadia, thank you for that. Certainly trying to get back to some sort of normal life, possibly within the rules of social distancing. Concern expressed there, obviously, still too, uh, about coronavirus and the cases that we're seeing uh, across the country, including across Europe as well. Um, all too easy to focus too much on just the situation here in the United Kingdom. Governments across Europe have taken on the challenge in many different ways. Restrictions, as you know, are coming in all the time. In Italy, for example, it held out for so long. Restrictions announced yesterday coming in today, giving more power to the regional mayors. Belgium too, pubs, bars, restaurants closed for a month. So let's see how it's impacting people then in one country, in Spain. Let's hear from Israel, who lives there. And Israel, are you under some form of lockdown where you live? Yeah, yeah, we are. We are right now, yeah. Well, here in Orense, we are like in a kind of a local partial uh, lockdown so that uh, we are not allowed to leave uh, this city um, just unless medical work reasons. Uh, also, uh, we cannot meet uh, people uh, we are not living with. And yeah, uh, pubs, clubs uh, have been closed since August, but bars and restaurants uh, can only serve uh, takeaway food or in the outside areas or terrace, yeah, uh, if they have one actually, yeah. And uh, they are not allowed like to serve like more than five people uh, per table. And yeah, well, today, Mm, the active cases here, uh, the figures are like uh, finally going down, but uh, in some areas such as like uh, Castilla y León, uh, Catalonia, they are going like the other way around. So uh, I don't know how it's going to be like in a week, but we will see. Yeah.
Indeed so. Well, at least some better news for your area, Israel, in Spain there. Thank you very much indeed, and the experience of so many, of course, across Europe. As if we needed any more evidence of the differences between different parts of the UK in the response to coronavirus, we got it today when the Welsh First Minister, Mark Drakeford, announced a fire break lockdown in the country starting on Friday. Northern Ireland is already in a four-week circuit breaker lockdown. The question now is whether we need to adopt tougher measures right across the UK and adopt a full national lockdown, even if brief, as we head deeper into winter. In a full national lockdown, all pubs, restaurants, other hospitality businesses close, as well as schools and universities. People are encouraged to work from home. This could be in the form of a so-called circuit break, so therefore for a short period of time, or for the longer term, like in New Zealand, for example, a country praised for locking down early with strict measures, which has only seen 25 confirmed COVID-related deaths and just over 1,800 cases since the start of the pandemic. The public, according to our poll, would back tougher restrictions. We asked whether they would support a circuit breaker lockdown where the whole country goes into a strict lockdown for at least two weeks. Two thirds, 67%, as you can see, said that they would support it. 26% said they would not. 8% didn't know. So, audience, let's hear from you once again. Do you agree with the public in our poll? Would you like to see another lockdown applied not just at the level of devolved nations, regions or cities, but right across the whole of the UK? Hands up or thumbs up, as I can see there, if you support a circuit break. OK, I would say that's probably over half of you. Interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's hear then from someone who advocates a national lockdown. Tricia McKinley is in Edinburgh. Tricia, why so? Um, for me, I think it would be incredibly hard for people to go through a second national lockdown. But I think there needs to be one for a minimum of three weeks. I know how difficult people will find that. I know the economy, the economy is going to suffer undoubtedly. Um, but I think our governments need to provide a much more realistic measure to support and protect the economy, to protect low income workers and, and more importantly, our wonderful NHS. Um, we need to be clear on this. People are dying. You know, our behaviours are costing lives. People are so au fait now about self-isolating, about wearing face masks. You know, it's, it's not happening now. Um, I have lost friends to this horrendous pandemic and, and I don't want to lose anybody else. Tricia, I'm really sad to hear that. That is the experience of many people, obviously, supporting a lockdown, Tricia, there, even if it is unbearably hard. And we saw it today, Wales then, following Northern Ireland with a time-limited lockdown and calling it a firebreak, according to its First Minister. No household mixing, working from home, the closure of non-essential shops and hospitality businesses. Schools, though, kept open for younger children anyway. We saw in our poll that the policy has support across the general public. But let's talk now to a supporter of that action from Wales. Glyn is in Bridgend. Glyn, a supporter then, tell us why. Because I think that the local Welsh lockdowns that we have had haven't done enough to bring the virus under control. It's unwelcome, of course, nobody likes it. My wife and I aren't looking forward to staying apart from family again and having our church close again, but our local hospitals are struggling again and I think it needs to be done. I do feel for the businesses which have to close again, it's particularly hard for them. But I think that if the lockdown were delayed for the sake of the economy, we'd end up being forced into a much longer lockdown when the virus was too far out of control and that would be even worse for businesses and jobs. So I think the action should be sooner and shorter rather than later and longer. And it may even need to be repeated, but that I guess is how we will live with the virus until we have a vaccine or some other way out of it. Sharp and deep, uh, Glyn, that's how your First Minister described it today. Thank you very much indeed for that. So let's speak to our panel and Anders Tegnell, Sir Mark Walport and Professor Calypso Chalkadu. Um, Sir Mark, I'm going to start with you. You're on SAGE. SAGE recommended on the 21st of September the government should have a circuit breaker. How disappointed are you that they did not? 
Well, look, the evidence is now pretty clear. So there are about 528 people in ventilator beds now. Uh, after the first wave of the pandemic, there were about 60, and that was the case throughout August until it started to rise. Um, we've got to get on top of this pandemic. And so I think there is a pretty strong scientific consensus that to control the pandemic, we've got to increase the social distancing because at the end of the day, this virus jumps from one person to another and therefore we have to keep people apart as far as we can. Um, and uh, test and trace has already been mentioned. The challenge I think it's faced all along is that it's been chasing demand. What it's got to do is get ahead of demand. And the only way that we're gonna be able to live with this virus in the longer term on top by using very good public health measures, using tests and trace, and really when outbreaks are getting on top of them quickly. So there are pretty strong scientific arguments that we are gonna to have to reduce it. And uh, the evidence also is that cases are rising across the country. Um, and so other parts of the country are catching up. Um, and we're seeing the infection, which is was initially mainly in very young, in young people, uh, now catching up and starting to infect more and more older people. And so death rates are rising and are likely to continue to rise. Uh, so uh, we are going to have to stop this. And it does come back to the fact that the economy may suffer just as much if we don't. Professor Chalkadu, circuit breakers are already happening. Wales, for example, just today, people seem to support it. We saw it with our poll. But the argument goes that it punishes those areas are doing well. The hairdresser in North Norfolk, the restaurant in Cornwall will also be punished by this. Are you a supporter of the idea of a circuit breaker to buy time? Is this short lockdown where we need to be right now? Well, I wonder if we're being presented with uh, perhaps false choices and, and fairly unbalanced information. I think as Sage has also acknowledged, there's very limited evidence in support of the effectiveness of lockdowns. Uh, and that's quite problematic because we've been here eight months ago and we're still in the same situation, not quite knowing what the impact of, uh, of lockdowns actually is. Certainly a national lockdown is a fairly uh, draconian and absolute measure so if we do go down that road we must make sure that uh, we have a strong evaluation uh, wrapped around that to really try and understand what the impact is of what we're doing but all in all i think lockdowns are not some sort of a magic panacea solution for preventing death eradicating the virus and getting us back to the pre-covid uh, normal i think it's quite important to understand uh, when and why to introduce such a a solution and i think I do agree with what David Navarro of the World Health Organization said earlier today, where he, he basically said that uh, it's a punitive thing to do to put Britain back into a national lockdown, even for two weeks. Um, and instead, really, we should concentrate on, uh, on test, trace, isolate. We should concentrate on communicating to people what exactly it is uh, that we ought to be careful about, social distancing, masks, hand washing, what the Swedes have done, to communicate, treating people as adults as opposed to introducing those lockdowns, which ultimately will have to be repeated over and over and over again. They're not a solution. They're not gonna get rid of the virus for us. And what we do need to bear in mind is that they have a direct cost on non-COVID health, on cancer, on mental health, on diabetes, on hypertension. There's a massive backlog right now in the NHS. And when we talk about numbers potentially of prevented deaths, uh, thanks to a lockdown, we must also look at numbers of deaths caused by this type of absolute uh, measure. And we may still not know the full figure. Collateral damage, everyone agreed, is, is going to be big. That's the problem, isn't it, I suppose? Uh, one man, of course, who doesn't believe that a national lockdown is a panacea is Dr Tegnell. But we read in British newspapers over the weekend that even you in Sweden are now considering some form of restrictions. Is that the case? And what are you thinking of? No, not really. I mean, what we are working with now is that we try to keep the recommendations, restrictions that we have all the time, keep them in place and keep people remembering them. And that is a struggle, of course, because people even in Sweden are getting tired of this. And then we had said, OK, if we have a local problem, we'll go in there with some extra restrictions. Definitely not the lockdown. What we are talking about then is uh, maybe having gatherings slightly smaller than they are right now. They are at 50 now, maybe we'll take them down for a couple of weeks time to even smaller. But mainly as a signal to people that they need to go back to the most important thing, like we, we all said in this panel, I think, and that's keeping a social distance. 
And if you can get that into place, uh, I think you're going to be okay. A lockdown might work. Um, I think the evidence is shaky, uh, but it probably stops a little bit for a while. But the problem is, what do you do afterwards? Uh, because if you don't have a plan to what you do afterwards, a lockdown is just uh, sort of pushing your problems ahead for a couple of weeks. Uh, so whatever we do, lockdowns will not save us. Uh, they might break a very rapid increase of cases for a short time, but they will not be the long-term long-term solution. So you really need to have a long-term solution in place at the same time, if you really are in a position why, which UK might be now that you, you need to break it somehow. But the long-term uh, sustainable solutions is something you really need to have in place. But if the virus is out of control and hospitals are at the stage where they're beginning not to be able to cope, for example, the Liverpool city region, which is in our tier three, then do you think a circuit breaker or some form of strict restriction, Dr Tegnell, is viable? I don't know if it's viable, but I, but I understand that's the option you might you must go for, because somehow you need to, to send a very strong signal to your population that... Now we all need to pull together and we all need to keep uh, to have this social distance between us uh, so that we break all these uh, chains of transmissions so that uh, especially the healthcare services can get back into some kind of control, yes. Timing is everything. Um, so Mark, uh, I know you wanted it before. Is now the time though, when we begin to see that respiratory diseases in this country are beginning to be the worst they are. Is there still time for a circuit breaker if the national government decided they should do that? Absolutely. But I, I mean, I think this is slightly being set up as there being more difference between the three of us than perhaps there is. Um, the short answer is that the, the measures that Calypso was talking about to have long-term control are critical. So you do need to be able to have very good testing, very good case identification, very good isolation. But the problem is that you need to do it on a manageable number of cases in the first place. And with more than 17,000 cases a day at the moment rising, with beds filling up, we've got to get the cases down. And where I do disagree is that the first lockdown worked extremely well. Arguably, it was introduced too late, but it did bring the cases right down. Um, what didn't happen was that they were held down. And so I think that the way forward has got to be to get the cases down so that uh, testing and all of the public health measures can work properly, and then, keep the disease under control and treat it as a, in a much more chronic state. And that's the issue. And, and I would be worth coming back to Anders because there are different cultures in different countries. And uh, Sweden is naturally more socially distant and it has had, with respect, 10 times the rate of deaths as Norway. Okay, we're gonna come on to Sweden and your experience, Dr. Tegnell, in the next part of our programme, but you're right. It is very interesting to see how different populations react uh, in terms of how we move forward with it as well, not to mention how we uh, managed to, to, to handle the peak of the pandemic back in March, April. Well, we've been discussing the current state of the pandemic response in the UK and heard the arguments then for a stricter lockdown or a circuit breaker right across the country. Many prominent people in politics and the media, especially on the right though, argue that current measures go too far. Instead, they say, we must be much harder nosed about protecting those most at risk and allowing others to get on with their lives. And if we look across the channel into Europe, we see at least one country which has modelled that response. Spain certainly isn't one of them, though. Instead, a state of emergency has been called in Madrid. People cannot leave or enter the capital for non-essential reasons, and restaurants and workplaces are limited to 50% capacity. In France, then, a curfew is in place between 9pm and 6am. One country, though, has taken a very different approach since the start. There was no mandatory lockdown in Sweden. Nearly 6,000 people have died there from COVID-19, according to Johns Hopkins University. That is 58.4 per 100,000 people. In comparison, the United States has a rate of 66.5. Last month, it was announced that Sweden's economy will shrink around 4.6% this year, significantly less than many other European countries, including the UK. Well, as you know, we have the man behind Sweden's response with us tonight, Anders Tegnell. You certainly made some big decisions, didn't you, at the start of this pandemic. Were you right on balance? 
I think we were right in many things, and we did not really completely understand that some of the weaknesses, especially in the nursing homes in Sweden, uh, would have some such a devastating effect uh, when this disease was introduced into them. But we managed to keep our health services running uh, with a very high quality of care, uh, took care of all the COVID-19 cases. There were always free beds for COVID-19, but also took care of the emergency uh, also entering into those systems. So it, it worked in those ways. Uh, we managed to not uh, get the cases down as quickly as in other countries, but we got the continuous uh, slowing down of the disease spread uh, from April on, onwards uh, with the same measures in place. And I think the most important thing, we, we had a population behind us. I mean, in any kind of poll, we had 80, 90% of the population said that they were happy to keep on following our restrictions. And I think that was very much part of the success. But the nursing homes turned out to be a huge problem. Uh, after a month or two, that was remedied to a great extent. And, and now for the last three or four months, we have had a, almost no spreading in our nursing homes in spite of having a spread in society. And I think to me that shows that it is possible to, to run our strategy and to keep our nursing homes safe. But unfortunately, in the beginning, uh, many of the nursing homes were not really prepared to, to take on the challenge that they had to take on. We share your pain on, on nursing homes. That has been a big lesson, hasn't it? I think for, for very many nations. At the time, you said, judge me in a year. You've been judged throughout. And uh, in May, Sweden had one of the highest death rates per capita in the world, obviously overtaken now by North and South America. How did you feel then? Did you feel isolated? Did you feel anxious? Did you feel concerned for, for your population in Sweden? Of course, we are worried when we see those those numbers. On the other hand, we must also realize how difficult it is to, to measure mortality. Uh, and in Sweden, we have a very strict uh, way of measuring them. And we do know that we, we collect and we count a lot more cases than in many other countries, uh, especially in the US and Americas on the whole. Uh, so the difference is probably not uh, as big as it is seen sometimes. But of course, we all, we all the time wonder if we're doing the right things. Uh, but we had a very good dialogue uh, with many of the nursing homes. And there was a lot of understanding of uh, what uh, the mistakes were that uh, to some extent were made in those. And when they were rectified, uh, the situation improved very rapidly. And I think that uh, made the whole thing easier. And it also made the whole thing easier that really had the support of the population all through this, even during the difficult times. Many in America hold up Sweden as the great example of what to do. President Trump's new coronavirus advisor, Scott Atlas, says lockdowns kill people. Do you agree with that basic statement? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, Sweden has had the lockdown. I mean, we closed down the society a lot. And uh, I mean, you can compare how much we stopped traveling in Sweden and we stopped traveling in Sweden more than they stopped traveling in our neighboring countries. So you shouldn't underestimate the kind of lockdown we put into place. We did it without legal measures to a great extent, uh, but that's a completely different thing. Uh, Swedish society stopped a lot. I mean, we, we, we think that we diminished our social contacts with at least 50%. Uh, we stopped working, we stopped going to work um, in about 30% of the cases and so on. So of course there was a lockdown. Uh, on the other hand, I can agree to with a statement to a certain extent. I think we have sometimes been a bit um, hasty in putting a lot of restrictions in place without thinking about the, the consequences for public health as a whole. And I think that's what we, we need to think a lot more about in the future. So we don't do more harm than good uh, with putting all, more measures into place. Um, so, Mark, you were nodding there. Uh, I know that mobile phone and other data does actually show that Swedes stayed home almost more than predicted um, at the time. But do you think a Swedish type model, given our denser populations, housing, possibly we don't have such trust in our government, Sir Mark, do you think it would have been possible here in this country? I frankly think it's very unlikely. Um, the density of people in the UK is far higher. Uh, in Sweden, for example, there are a much higher proportion of people living in single households, um, it is just different. And, and the answer is the infection probably came up in it, it, We were all dealt different hands of cards, if I can put it that way, in that, you know, UK global hub, 
uh, global hub cities, Brussels, London, New York, tended to do badly. Uh, we know that there were over 1,300 essentially silent introductions of the virus at the end of March, uh, after the half term then, when people brought it back from France, from Spain, from Italy. Um, it came in in different ways. And so it's been very widely distributed in a country with a higher uh, density of people um, and a different culture. Um, and uh, clearly, America is much more libertarian in outlook, but, you know, is, is my liberty uh, to do what I want um, uh, balanced against my liberty to kill someone else because I give them the infection? Uh, these are very, very difficult arguments. Yes, and Germany certainly felt that at the start, the cases they had were younger people who had returned from the ski resorts. I know one ski resort in Austria is said to have shipped it out to 45 different countries. So that was a, that was a really big impact. In this country, you know, UK half term perhaps brought many of the cases in. Um, Clip, so I know you are concerned about the unintended consequences of lockdowns. Uh, one official figure put it at 75,000 people in this country who will have unintended consequences. Do you think, would you like to see more of a, a Swedish approach where you, you trust the public perhaps to do, to do, their, to do the right thing by, uh, by all of us? Well, well, trust works both ways. I think, uh, yeah, trust the public, but also the public needs to trust the authorities. And I think, unfortunately, so far, we've had such a uh, a complex and conflicting series of messages that uh, has it's blown public trust completely. And that's really problematic and worrying because it's not just about the importance of complying with government guidance in managing this, but also in the near future, the importance, for instance, for getting, getting the vaccine, being, you know, getting vaccinated. And if you don't have the trust of the public, if people are not quite sure why it is you're saying what you're saying, why are you changing your mind, why this, why that, uh, then it's very problematic in getting compliance, which is, of course, very important. What I would like to see more of is a quantification and a discussion of uh, modelled, perhaps, obviously, as we model potential COVID deaths, of modelled uh, deaths and the impact of uh, those policy measures you're taking on uh, non-COVID uh, health sector. So the impact on cancer, the impact on mental health. And we have a lot of this work is being done. Colleagues, for instance, such as Professor Richard Sullivan at King's or Professor Sir Simon Wesley uh, talked about the toll on mental health and suicides, cancer. We're looking at people missing on uh, their treatments, uh, late diagnosis, late presentation. And this is the sort of excess mortality, excess deaths that we'll see down the road. Young people uh, who will basically lose their lives because they didn't go to the hospital, because they're worried, because of the lockdown, because of the virus, because of the perceptions. And we need to start quantifying this. Every time we talk about uh, modeled forecasts of uh, potentially lives saved from COVID because of a, an intervention, especially draconian interventions such as lockdowns, we need to cite in the same sentence, ideally, numbers of modeled deaths of people if we were to go down that route. And I think in parallel, we need to talk about the economy. It's not a dichotomy. Poverty kills, and poverty kills the poor more than the rich. And we need to be able to also have sight of what it means uh, in terms of unemployment, in terms of losing your schooling, your education, uh, in terms of social unrest. This creates premature mortality. People will die early because of recessions, because of poverty. And again, we need to look at those figures too. Every time, every single time before we consider a change or an introduction of radical and absolute uh, policy measures. Yes, and certainly we had um, the, the figures out for people dying at home, which had gone up. But out of the more than 56,000 excess deaths for this period, 50,000, I think, were COVID. So, but as you say, people are still feeling the effects. There's a delay, isn't there? Definitely in terms of undiagnosed conditions. Well, let's hear now from our audience and what they make of that argument that we should, like Sweden early on, target our restrictions more on those most vulnerable and loosen them on other areas of life. So, uh, audience, if you don't mind, let's have a show of hands whether you would prefer to see that that the vulnerable restrict themselves and the rest of people get on and live their lives. What are your thoughts? Hands up if you approve of that. Okay, maybe a quarter of you, slightly less than that actually support that. Uh, one of our audience members though, who thinks we need to learn to live with the virus, Deji Suyemi from Dagenham. Deji, hello to you, tell us your view then. Uh, yes, so in my view, I think the current postcode lockdown is not needed and should be scrapped. 
ever since the pandemic began, United Kingdom has been disunited in many ways. We've had different approaches from different regions and devolved countries. This is clearly not working. If it is, we will not be talking about another lockdown. A house that is divided against itself cannot and will not stand. We have to learn to live with this virus and manage this situation as one united country. As best as we can, of course, rather than taking or keep taking people's livelihood away. So as long as we're gonna have a movement of people between these countries, a local or postcode lockdown will never work. Thank okay. you, Anna. Deji. Deji, thank you very much indeed. Uh, no lockdown. A united country needs to learn to live with this. What about our poll then carried out with YouGov, suggesting that British people, though, are not in favour of relaxing restrictions over coronavirus. We asked whether people support relaxing lockdown measures for younger people while maintaining rules for older and more vulnerable people. 26% supported that idea, but the overwhelming majority, 64% opposed it, 10% didn't know. You're nodding again, Sir Mark. The Barrington Decla Declaration, some might say, wanted that, did they not? Uh, you obviously don't approve of it. Would it be dangerous, do you think, to go down that route? Absolutely. In this case, the British public are absolutely right and the evidence supports them. Um, and uh, keeping generations apart is effectively impossible. People live in multi-generational families, actually particularly people from... Uh, Asian backgrounds from black backgrounds. So uh, you can't keep people apart. And what we're seeing at the moment is that whilst it started uh, this uh, second wave predominantly in younger people, it is spreading into older people. You simply can't do it. And when it comes to the concept of just leaving it and letting it rip and we'll all get herd immunity, again, the evidence is absolutely against the people that say this is a sensible thing to do. We know that a relatively small minority of the population in the UK have had this virus so far, and the rest do not want to get it if they can avoid it. Um, and also the idea that it just kills, as, as it were, a, an elderly, uh, chronically ill segment of the population. We know that those that recover from a severe illness, severe illness can be ill for quite a long time. And we also know that young people sometimes get uh, this thing called long COVID, which is probably a series of different syndromes. So, even if you apparently get it mildly, it's not benign. Um, so, uh, as I say, the, that, that concept is not supported by any significant body of scientific opinion at all. OK, so Mark, thank you very much indeed. More from the panel in just a moment. On postcode lockdown, a divided nation, then we've been examining the options for policymakers to take on the pandemic over the winter. As we've seen, there are flaws with both relaxing restrictions and a blanket new national lockdown. So is there a route which balances health and wealth which we can follow? Well, let's go again to our audience and hear some of their views on how we can improve our handling of the pandemic. Compliance is critical, uh, obviously. Let's get the thoughts then of Maria. Hello, Anna. Good evening. Um, yeah, I lost my mother to COVID-19. Um, I also work for the NHS. And from what I've witnessed, I think we've become a nation that can't obey rules. The government in the past has suggested bringing in the armed forces to assist the police. And it's proven from the discussion tonight that countries that have a bigger success with communities adhering to lockdowns and partial lockdowns and the recommended restrictions such as social distancing and even simple mask wearing, all of those countries benefit from a two and three tiered police force. And I think, uh, well, I question, is this something that now needs to happen in these UK COVID hotspots where clearly we have huge amounts of people who are not adhering to anything? Maria Esposito from, uh, from Surrey, thank you very much indeed for that. So greater adherence then to the rules by using possibly the resources of the police and the armed services. One of the thorniest issues for the government during the pandemic has been how to stop people bringing in the virus from abroad. We already mentioned, didn't we, the resort of Ischgl in Austria, skiing holidays in the Alps back in February and early March, blamed for seeding many of the cases which first broke out in the UK. Later on, obviously, the government bringing in quarantine regulations. 
So how could we detect people who are carrying the virus more easily, perhaps without suspecting it? Let's hear the idea of Margot Ward, who is in Devon. Margot. Hello, Anna. Why aren't we making use of man's best friend during this pandemic? Dogs are very easily trained to sniff out cancers, drugs, landmines, etc. So why not COVID? 16 dogs are already employed at Helsinki Airport, working shifts in teams of four. The dogs are able to sniff out people who are asymptomatic or not yet showing symptoms quicker than a standard COVID test. Our UK medical detection dogs are already training six dogs to sniff out COVID. Should we be training many teams of dogs to work at all UK airports to try to lessen the transmission from overseas? Thank That's you, Anna. A lovely idea. Thank you, Margot. Yes, OK. And thank you to the audience for those thoughts. So technology, research, science may, of course, be the route out of the pandemic via a vaccine, for example. But should we be holding out for that solution? According to our Sky poll, the public is split over whether it will be possible to tame the virus without one. We asked whether it is possible to solve the issue of COVID-19 before a vaccine is discovered or if it will only be possible after a vaccine is in use. 40% then said it could be sold before a vaccine, 43% only once it was discovered, 17% not sure. To our audience again, once again, what do you make of that? Do you think we'll have to wait for a vaccine before we can control the coronavirus? Hands up if we should wait for a virus, for a vaccine rather. One, two, three, four, five, okay. You seem more optimistic. Let's speak then to Anders Tegnell, Sir Mark Walport and uh, Professor Calypso. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, let's go to you then, Professor Chalkadu. Vaccine, will that be the great panacea that we're looking for? Well, a vaccine is a, an absolutely essential part of, um, of the response. And hopefully we will have one or more um, uh, in a year's time or so. Um, now, whether it will be the silver bullet we're all hoping it to be, uh, that's that's questionable, perhaps not the first generation, perhaps the second generation vaccines will be more effective. But ultimately, without a vaccine, uh, the virus will have to uh, go into a population and reach some form of population level immunity, which will take a long time, which will be difficult, as we've just been discussing. Uh, we need to be maintaining social distancing, um, all these measures we've been talking about. So it may well take years until it becomes endemic, if you like, and resurface every year, maybe. Now, this may also happen with a suboptimal uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So it's not necessary that a vaccine will solve things. But really, I think it's quite important in our toolkit. A COVID vaccine is a quite important tool in, uh, in tackling uh, this uh, outbreak. And yet, uh, Sir Mark, we heard from Sir Patrick Vallance today um, suggesting it will be next spring at the earliest before we see something. Um, is, is that right? Should we hold out for it? Will it make a difference given the fact that other coronaviruses, there are obviously no vaccines for them? Well, in the sense that I'm not sure holding out for it is the right, the right terminology. We need, around the world, people are going as hard as possible to create vaccines and they're being tried out. Um, and uh, there is a reasonable chance that one of these vaccines will prove uh, effective to, to some degree. So we have to go for that. But I mean, that doesn't mean that whilst we're waiting for that, we ignore everything else, as it were. And the other thing is that there are other approaches. So we know much more about the treatment of this disease, which no one, no one had ever seen before uh, until this year. And so oxygen demands in hospital being met better, people are ventilated better. And we know from very careful clinical trials that drugs that are anti-inflammatory, such as dexamethasone, can reduce the death rate by up to a third in people that have that severe late inflammation that's what kills people. Um, and we have to do more clinical trials. There are antibodies being tried that can bind to the virus. So um, uh, that's another approach, the Regeneron, but there are other companies manufacturing them as well. Um, and sadly, we also know that there are some drugs that have been tried that don't appear to work. And so hydroxychloroquine does nothing. And recently, 
just in the past couple of days, evidence has come out that this antiviral drug, remdesivir, which seems to reduce the number of days people spend in hospital, doesn't appear to have a significant effect on mortality. So we need every possible measure. And uh, it's likely that the mortality is going to be much lower in hospital, which is a good thing or significantly lower at any rate. We have to do everything we can to get a vaccine and predicting the future is extremely difficult. We're waiting uh, the results of the trials that are going on at the moment. Um, if a vaccine does become and shows effectiveness, then it, you know, it makes a lot of sense for people to have it. Uh, vaccines have been one of the most powerful ways of uh, controlling infectious disease. You know, if you look at the things that change public and health and enable populations to live on average longer, it's been clean water and vaccines that have made the biggest difference. Yes, uh, you didn't even mention the monoclonal antibodies, which President Trump declared was his, his cure, although he did take remdesivir as well, didn't he, um, as, as you know. Um, and as Tegnell, I know you suggested right at the start that the vaccine would take at least a year. That's one of the reasons you suggested Sweden should learn to live with this. The concept of herd immunity was also central to, to your idea. Do you still be, believe in that? And do you think Sweden has edged close to herd immunity? We never really believed in herd immunity. We talked about that uh, immunity in the population is going to make some kind of effect, but herd immunity is not possible to achieve without a really good vaccine. Uh, but I think the danger with saying that we're going to wait for the vaccine is that there seems to be some kind of myth about that then we can all go back to normal. I mean, it's not going to be that easy. Um, if we get a good vaccine, we might hopefully be able to protect the vulnerable part of our population better if we get a vaccine that works in those parts of the population. And that will, of course, uh, mean that it's going to be much easier to deal with this disease than today. And if we get some good treatments, that will also improve. Uh, but in the, all in all, none of these things are really going to get us completely rid of this virus. We, we need also have long-term things in place that we can live with for a long, long time, because this disease is going to be with us for a long time. And to think that we're going to eradicate it with a vaccine, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, maybe never, but definitely not within, within the kind of life span most of, had, most of us have. Yes, indeed, the four coronavirus that we live with day in, day out are endemic, are they not? And we've learnt to live with them. Uh, we will see what happens with that, certainly. To the audience, though, uh, if there was a vaccine available right now, would you take it? Hands up. That's not quite everybody, but I think it probably is a majority of people. Um, we're approaching the end of postcode lockdown, a divided country. It's a huge subject matter. We've heard about tougher lockdowns, lighter restrictions, and whether vaccines are the only ultimate way out. What should government do next? What should government do now? Let's go to our panel then. Um, OK, <laughs> Dr Tegnell, let's start with you. Very quickly, if you don't mind, what should the British government do now? I wouldn't dare to advise the British government, but I think it's uh, you really need to understand what is the, the worst part, where is the disease spread most, and really concentrate your efforts on that so you don't lock down too many things because then the lockdown is going to have a lot of negative effects. It's probably going to be worse uh, than the positive effects. Could. So I think the trick is really to try to understand what are the sort of serious areas you need to, to, to stop the transmission in. Professor Cholkadu, you were nodding your head there. Targeted lockdowns or targeted restrictions you support. What's your advice to government right now then? I think it's really important that policies refocus um, from just COVID-19 and the direct management of the pandemic to broader welfare issues. We need to think about the collateral damage of the policy interventions of the virus itself, uh, if it was, were left unchecked, but also the policies introduced. We need to be in a position to talk about people's livelihoods, education, uh, employment, cancer, diabetes. These are important areas of people's lives. And we need, if we can measure potential COVID deaths, we need to be able to measure the impact of policies on education, on other types of, uh, of health and disease. And uh, unfortunately, if we don't do that, if the welfare agenda is left behind, I think we will lose the public. I think it will be an even greater crisis of trust. Uh, and so for the measures to work, we need to be able to communicate exactly what the target is. And we need to be able to demonstrate that our perspective is way broader than just COVID, however important COVID is. It's about welfare, 
and it's about having social cohesion, Kadeem, being able to survive a society going forward. I don't mean to interrupt you. The last minute, Sir Mark Walport, is yours. You're already a sage advisor. This is your day job. What's the message for government? Well, I mean, the answer is get the infection under control, get the numbers down across the country, uh, emphasise to everyone that we do need to maintain social distancing. Once the numbers are down, make sure we don't let them go up again by having very good public health measures to keep it under control, so test and trace. Keep working hard to develop new treatments, to improve the therapy, get a vaccine. And at the same time, of course, we have to worry about the economy. The evidence is being collected. Unfortunately, coronavirus is a virus that strikes poor people more than richer people. Um, and so uh, all of those points are well made. The NHS, as Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer, is saying, is open for business for all diseases. And it's very important that if people have an illness which would normally take them to casualty, then that's what they should do. Um, and so uh, it's not a question of one thing or another. We've got to have a whole series of measures and we have got to take individual and collective responsibility to keep this thing under control. Panel, our audience have been voting. I want you to vote now. On a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is really bad, how concerned are you about the winter? All of you vote at the same time. Hold up your fingers for, for a scale of 1 to 10, please. Oh, see, <laughs> us that was supposed to... <laughs> <laughs> You're not sure. Is that a 5? I think it's a 5. <laughs> uh, lovely to have you on. Thank you so much. Anders Tegnell, Sweden State Epidemiologist, Sir Mark Walport, Sage Advisor, former Chief Scientific Advisor, and Calypso Chalkadu, Professor of Public Health at Imperial College London. Thank you so much for your time. Big thanks, too, to our audience. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for watching. <laughs>